So today we would be looking at encouragement. This is perhaps going to be a short message and afterwards we would have some time to pray. But the Lord today has sent us words of hope, words of life, and words of strength. He has seen our state. He has seen our current state. He has seen where we have been for months. He has seen where we have been for weeks. And what he has now decided to do today is to send us a word of encouragement. That we as a people will no longer be discouraged. That we as a people will begin to ascend. Because the Lord has seen a people, the Lord has seen a church, the Lord has seen a nation that has been discouraged because many felt that promises were not kept, that prophecies were not fulfilled, that the will and the counsel of God that was spoken about was not done. And the Lord is saying that I have come in response to your heart cry and I have come in response to your despondency to bring you hope, to bring you strength and to bring you life. So this word from the Lord is a word to bring hope to the hopeless, strength to the weary, and life to as many that have become lifeless as a result of the many situations and problems and the issues of life that have seemed to suffocate many of us. And so he has sent us a word to bring hope, a word to bring strength, and a word to bring life. Discouragement is not a good state, not a good place, not a good phase for one to be in. And so the Lord has seen that and he's coming in response to that to bring transformation, to bring change and to cause us to ascend from the valley of despondency onto his holy mount. There have been times when you as an individual may have been downcast and it has felt as though you would be downcast for a period of time, and then you would come into the presence of God, have fellowship or sing a song or do something and it goes. And then later on, it comes back and it now feels like a vicious circle of highs and lows, lows and highs, up and down. But the Lord desires that we will stay up. He desires that we will be encouraged. He desires that we will stay encouraged. And it is for that reason that the Lord has now visited us today. Discouragement is a deadly place to be in. It's a deadly state to be in. It is a phase that will short circuit what the Lord seeks to do in us, through us, and within us as a community. And so the Lord desires that we be encouraged and not discouraged. We will be looking at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, from verse 13 to 31. Discouragement is a dead weight that will slow us down in our journey, and it is also a precursor for depression. Many times it all starts with discouragement. You are, you are, you are discouraged because your hope was deferred, your hope was dashed. What you thought was coming did not come through. And as a result of that, from that state of discouragement and despondency, you now move into a state of depression where nothing makes sense. Even to the point of asking questions like, why am I even alive? What am I, I've not been able to amount to anything and nothing makes sense to you. And so the Lord seeks to truncate that journey of depression. He seeks to bring it to an end so that as many of us that are still in that valley of despondency or have those highs you know, little highs and then so much more lows, you know, like more than half the time, you're just downcast and sad because what you were expecting did not come to pass. Perhaps it could be something maritally in a marriage or an expected marriage or in a job or an expected job or something that has to do with one's family or one's, one's career, or one's academics, one's journey in Christ, whatever the case may be. The Lord desires that he would take us out of the valley of despondency and take us into a place where we would abide with him on his holy mount, where the joy of the Lord becomes our strength and our strength indeed. So discouragement is a dead weight that we as a people need to shed off, that we as a people need to drop at the feet of Christ today. 
if you're in that state where you've been downcast, you've been downtrodden, you've been despondent, right now, just under your breath, right now, just under your breath, just begin to pray. Tell yourself that I am leaving this weight at the feet of Christ today. I am leaving this weight at the feet of Christ today. If the weight has to do with your academics, it, it has to do with your career, your family, a marriage, whatever the issue is, tell yourself and talk to God right now that I am leaving this place light. I am not leaving this place with a heavy heart as a result of this encounter because we've come into a place of encounter with the Lord. It is not just you listening to me trying to weave certain scriptures. No, but this is a place of encounter. The Lord is saying, that he has brought us into a place of encounter. This is a place of encounter where the Lord seeks to encounter us today. So tell the Lord and speak to him and tell him that I am not living here. I am not leaving this meeting with that dead weight. I choose to share it. I choose to drop. I choose to lay down that dead weight. I choose to lay down that dead weight. Even as I speak, I see the Lord. I see the Lord asking of the weight, asking of the weight from us, asking of that burden from us. And he's saying, lay it down at my feet, lay it down at my feet. And I see his hand, his arm outstretched. And he says, give it to me, give it to me. Let that be your prayer. Let that be your heart's cry, even as we proceed. That at the end of this meeting, that every weight, every weight, every weight, every dead weight of discouragement, of despondency, of being sad, of being downtrodden, being downcast, being depressed, that every single dead weight that falls under any of these categories will be laid down at the feet of Christ. And we shall all live here, not with heavy hearts, but with our hearts light in the name of Jesus. Amen. Luke 24, from verse 13 to 31, it says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was a seven miles journey from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was where they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Now, what has happened is that Jesus had been crucified and he was no longer with them bodily. And the disciples of Christ had now plunged into a state of discouragement. They were all discouraged. And this was why when the Lord came, he said, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And so that was their state, a state of sadness and a state of discouragement. Because they thought that, oh, this was going to happen and it has not happened. We had this promise. We, we thought that he was going to do this and then it did not happen. But one thing that we've seen from here from verse 16 is that it says, but their eyes were restrained that they did not know him. So what discouragement does to us is that, so we're looking at the implications of discouragement. And one of the things that it does, even as we see here, is that it causes our sights to go dim. It blurs our vision. And this was the case of the disciples here. It says that their eyes were restrained that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have one with another as you walk and are sad? So what discouragement will do to an individual, what discouragement will do to us is that it'll cause our sights to go dim. It'll cause us to have our visions blurred, and it will also dull our understanding. Personally, there have been times when, as a result of discouragement, my my sights, my sight in the spirit, in the area of visions, and even in the area of understanding, it all became blurry and I could not see clearly until I came to a point where I was able to ascend out of that and then the Lord would now begin to speak to me. This has happened more than once. So as a result of discouragement, there are things that the Lord will be trying to reveal to you as an individual, but that you may not see. He may be trying to speak to you, but you may not hear. He may be trying to commune with you, but you will not be able to interface with him. Why? Because of discouragement. 
And this was what was happening to the disciples here. And if you read through this chapter, you would see all that took place. You know, you know, from a reader's point of view, when you're reading, you'll be like, like just, just like me, when I'm reading, I'll be like, couldn't they have known that he was the one with the things he was saying? But their sight was restrained. And just in case you think that, oh, maybe Jesus just did it. He was the one that restrained their sight. He ensured that they did not see. No, that came as a consequence of their state. Because as we will later see in this chapter, he rebuked them. It doesn't make sense for, for Jesus to, to close your eyes and then he will now rebuke you for having your eyes closed. This was a result of the state that the disciples were in. Now, something similar happened in, in Jonah, Jonah chapter four. From Jonah chapter one, we see what the Lord was doing with Jonah. For time's sake, we can't go there. We see what the Lord was doing with Jonah, how he sent him to Nineveh. It's a, it's a common story, and I believe most of us know the story. But Jonah was set in his own way. He wanted something. He wanted an outcome. And because of that outcome, he knew what the Lord would do. He knew the ways of God, and he didn't want to go. Even after being rescued, being delivered from the, the belly of the big fish, he still did not change. And then when we now come to Jonah chapter 4, something now happened. God caused a tree to grow overnight. And overnight, the same tree withered. God caused it to happen. Now, even with such a supernatural sign to Jonah, it still was not clear to him what the Lord was doing. Why? He was downcast. He was sad. Jonah could not see until the Lord rebuked him at the very end. And if you read the book of Jonah, how it ends in chapter 4, the very, towards the very end, you will see that it ended with a rebuke from the Lord. Because with the supernatural signs that the Lord caused to occur, to happen, he still could not see. He still could not understand. And this is what discouragement can do to an individual. And this is what discouragement has been doing to many of us. All you see right now is not all there is. There is so much more. There is so much more. In my personal work with God, I've been able to prove this time and time again. There are times when, during the period of discouragement, I, because almost every day when, when I interface with the Lord, there's always something that the Lord is saying, always something that the Lord is saying. And in those moments of discouragement and being downcast, it is so, so difficult to interface. And even what the Lord is saying and doing, I don't get those until I, when I'm able to ascend out of it. And then what now happens is that a backlog of revelation now begins to come things that the Lord sought to reveal that I was unavailable to receive. Let's carry on. Verse 18. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. One other thing that we see discouragements doing here is that they began to question the plan of God. And one of the things that discouragement will do to us is that it will cause us to begin to question the validity of God's plan for us, the validity of God's word to us. Perhaps you, you have had prophecies, you've received prophecies, personal prophecies, and God has spoken to you as an individual. Other people have, have come and time and time again, you've had multiple confirmations and you were so certain and so sure that this was what God was saying to me as an individual. And then in your own estimation, time passes and you've not seen it come to pass. And then you begin to question, was it really God? Was it really God that spoke? If it was God, how come? And perhaps you know that he's God, but you now begin to question the ways of God. And this is part of what discouragement can cause. This is part of what discouragement can lead to. This is also why the Lord seeks that we are not discouraged. There are words that we, we it's, it is common knowledge. We have prophecies for Nigeria as an, as an example. 
Um, we all prayed, we all interceded. We had prayer chains for 100 days, for 40 days, for 30 days, you know, different lengths of time. I've been in different prayer meetings that have gone on for months. And right now we've come into a phase where many have already given up hope. And they're like, I don't think it's going to come to pass. You know, some have already concluded that, you know, the ways of God, when it comes to national politics, God does not interfere. God can give you personal prophecy and you come to pass. But when it comes to a nation, it, you know, it does not happen. So we're now using uh, our own experiences to now begin to explain the ways of God instead of using the word of God to understand the ways of God and cause our experiences to line up with the same ways. Our experiences will definitely not always line up with the word of God. That is why we have the word of God as our plumb line. His word will reveal his ways, his counsel. It will reveal how he acts, how he has acted in times past. He does not change. And how you will act today, we've seen how God intervened in nations, not just in Israel, he intervened in diverse nations in the Bible. But as a result of discouragement, many of us now have new understandings of prophecy that are false and from the pit of hell, simply because of discouragement. So discouragement will cause us to question the validity of the word of God. It will cause us to question corporate prophecies, personal prophecies, global prophecies, national prophecies. God said this. We understood this, that this was what God said. There are multiple confirmations, but it did not come to pass. When you begin to do that, it is because you've come into that place of discouragement. Verse 22 now says, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? What we now see God doing here is that Jesus was rebuking the disciples because of their discouragement. They began to question the validity. They began to question, this was what was said before. How come it's not happening? We, we, we had this hope. Well, right now, that hope has been dashed. But he rebuked them because of that. So when you are discouraged and the Lord sends you a rebuke, he does so out of his love and out of his mercy. Because it is not always the case. It is out of his love and in his mercy that he will send you a rebuke to not be discouraged, to wake up out of your discouragement, to wake up out of your unbelief, because discouragement would also lead to unbelief. And this was what he was doing with the disciples here. He rebuked them. He said, oh foolish ones and slow of hearts to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? If he rebuked them, it means that it was not good. And if it was not good, it means that it was sin. So discouragement is a sin. This may come as a surprise to, to some of us, but discouragement is a sin. Now, in those days, it was a grievous crime to be sad in the presence of the king. And we have this in scripture in Nehemiah chapter 2 from verse 1 to 2. Nehemiah 2 from verse 1 to 2. So we're trying to answer the question, how is discouragement a sin? And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Nehemiah understood, he understood it. That it was a grievous crime to be sad in the presence of the king. And so because of that understanding, he was now afraid because the king had now taken note of his sadness. His sadness was now obvious to the king. And so he became scared. 
We understand that God is our king, he's our judge, he's also our lawgiver. And so when we come before his presence with sadness, being downcast and being downtrodden, let his understanding now be in us that just as it was with the kings in the ancient times, so it is with the Lord. Many may say, oh, that is kings of the earth. It does not apply, you know, it does not apply to the, the natural thing or it does not apply to how God operates with us in the natural. It was just something that was for the kings. No, these things are written in scripture for our instruction and for our learning. There have been times where, where I have seen, personally, I've, I've, I've seen visions. God has opened my eyes to see certain things, you know, that had taken place and he delivered me from. And but they only took place as a result of discouragement. In fact, there's this one that I recall, the details of which I don't even want to share because it, it is disgusting. What I've seen happening to me in the spirit as a result of being discouraged. And I was having a conversation with Apostle, the arrowhead, my father in the Lord. And at some, at some point he was sharing with me and he, I believe he associated with some of us the story of, of a prophet who was sad, who was discouraged. Because of a discouragement what happened, he got struck and became paralyzed. So it's important that we note that discouragement is also a sin. And so what happened here? Jesus rebuked the disciples. Verse 27, and then down to verse 31. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. It was in the breaking of bread that the understanding came, that their eyes became opened, that the revelation now came. But one of the things we see here, since our focus here is discouragement, one of the things we see here is that discouragement short circuits the flow of the resources of heaven to us. Discouragement is short circuits the flow of the resources of heaven to us. From where we have, we've just read, we have seen that God sent Jesus, his beloved son, and he came and he walked among them for about three years because his ministry was for three and a half years. And so he walked with them for that space of time and then he died. And even with that great deal of encounter, encounters and experiences that they had with him, it was still not enough. And then he came among them on the road to Emmaus and spoke with them and even expounded the scriptures to them. They still did not understand. That was the most precious resource that the father could release to send into the earth. So what discouragement will do is that it will short circuit the flow of the resources of heaven to us because he came among them and they did not know. They could not tell. On the 12th of August this year, 2023, on the 12th of August, I was in an encounter where the Lord was speaking to me and then he said something. I'm just going to share an excerpt from that encounter with the Lord. And this was what he said. He said, there have been three major doors opened unto you, which you have failed to enter, not out of disobedience because you did not know, but it was out of discouragement. Now, this was, this was God's rebuke to me at that point in time before he began to speak. And in his mercy, that very day, those three doors opened to me and I entered them by faith. The point is simple. Discouragement will cause us to not see, will cause us to not understand what God is doing. And in the process, it will now also come to that point where we could miss opportunities, where the resources of heaven could be released to us. And because of discouragement, we miss it. So discouragement has the capacity to short circuit the flow of the resources of heaven to us. So it's important that we arise out of our discouragement into a place of encouragement. We'll look at a couple of ways we can receive encouragement. So how can we receive encouragement? How can we be encouraged? The very first one that I would like us to see briefly is fellowship. I have broken fellowship into, into bits. And so the very first one is fellowship in prayer. 
Now, fellowship in prayer, especially praying in the Holy Ghost. I say especially praying in the Holy Ghost because we are all aware of the fact that when you are downcast, when you are sad, you know, when you're going through something, you may not be in that mood to pray. And at that point in time, praying in the Holy Ghost is a good way to stir up faith within us. Because the Bible says in Jude 1 verse 20, but you beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And a second scripture reference is Philippians 4 from verse 6 to 7. Philippians 4 from verse 6 to 7. So praying in the Spirit is one way that we can receive encouragement through fellowship with the Lord. Now, secondly, fellowship in spiritual songs. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and then Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 18 to 20. Colossians 3, verse 16, Ephesians 5, 18 to 20. I'll read Ephesians 5. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have psalms, we have hymns, we have spiritual songs. And then it says, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. So what praise and worship does is that it provides to us a strong antidote for discouragement. So we have said praying, especially praying in the Holy Ghost. And if at that point in time, that is hard for you to do, an alternative here is what? Praise and worship. Singing spiritual songs. I have found in my experience, and I know that to be true for many, for many others, that when you are going through a rough patch or a hard time, a song wells up from your heart. It wells up from your spirit. And many times those songs, they come from the Lord to speak to our situations and to give us encouragement, to ensure that we are stirred up and we are strengthened in the spirit. So singing, spiritual songs, psalms, hymns, they are all strong antidotes for discouragement. Three, fellowship in the word. Fellowship in the word. Psalms 119 from verse 47 to 50. Psalms 119 from verse 47 to 50. And then Jeremiah 15 verse 16. So I'll read Jeremiah 15 verse 16. And then we can read Psalms on our own. It says, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. He says, your word was to me rejoicing, joy and rejoicing of my heart. And so one other place, one other medium through which we can receive encouragement is the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. Perhaps you could be on a study plan or however it is your, your study routine goes. Now, through any of those routines, the Lord can always break through and give us words of encouragement. And just reading a scripture and then that, that scripture now begins to minister to you. Sometimes it could be as simple as the U version updates that, that you receive on your phone, perhaps the daily scriptures. So one way or the other, we can always receive encouragement from the word of God. And when we read through the Psalms, you will see how David and even others vent, they, they vent in the presence of the Lord. Just expressing, expressing one's heart before the Lord. And so prayer is not meant to be something that is strict or formal. Prayer has to be something that we do from that place of genuineness and truthfulness, where we express and pour out our hearts to the Lord. Fourthly, so the fourth dimension of fellowship is fellowship with the brethren. And the popular scripture for this is Hebrews 10, 25, which I believe we all know. And then I'll read Malachi 3, 16 to 17. Malachi 3, 16 to 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. It is an encouragement that comes from the place of fellowship with the brethren. There was this time when I was in a different country, 
not Nigeria, not Canada. And then I was in a, in a different country for a period of time. And while I was there, what happened to me was that when I would go for fellowship, it was like a cell meeting, a small group. Most of the time, what ministers to me is not the word because I did most of the sharing. But what ministered to me the most was that, that time of fellowship that I had with them. There were times I, I came to the meetings with, with, with weights and heaviness, and I left the meetings light. Why? Because I came into the midst of the brethren and I came there. And what happened? That heaviness was taken away in the presence of the Lord. And so there is something about fellowship with the brethren that ministers encouragement to us. That is why there's this saying that the church is like a hospital. You come together in the church and what happens? You are ministered to. If it's either through the word, through the songs, or through a sharing with one another. Just that atmosphere on its own carries an aura of encouragement. And this is one of the reasons why the Lord is saying that we should not despise the meeting of ourselves together. Because one of the things that the devil does is that when the devil wants to deal with a person, the devil can ensure that a person is isolated, still isolated and not mingling with others. I don't feel like talking. I don't feel like sharing. I just want to be there. And then you're there. And the devil now maximizes that opportunity to deal with you as an individual. Why? Because you are now apart from the brethren. And so the Lord desires that we should not forsake the fellowshipping of ourselves together. Watching videos, ministrations on YouTube does not cut it. Watching things on social media does not cut it. The Lord desires that we should enjoy fellowship with him in the midst of the brethren. After fellowship, the next point I'd like us to look at is, is prophecy. Prophecy. Second Chronicles 15, verse 8. Second Chronicles 15, verse 8. And it says, And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin, and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. And so Asa heard these words of prophecy of Oded the prophet, and then what happened? Courage came. He was encouraged. So prophecy brings encouragement. And when we read from 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, it says, But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So prophecy brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. But when we now go down to verse 31 of that same chapter of 1 Corinthians 14, what the Bible now says is this, For you all can prophesy one by one that all may learn, and all may be encouraged. So we see that in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 14, what the Bible has said concerning prophecy is that what? Prophecy brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. But then we now go down to verse 31. It now says that prophecy brings encouragement. This simply tells us that the encouragement that comes through prophecy is three-dimensional. It is threefold. It is edification, exhortation, and comfort. Edification to build us up. Exhortation to lift us up. And comfort to keep us up. And so these are the three different dimensions of prophecy. And these are the three different dimensions that, of encouragement that comes through prophecy. So if the prophetic word does not encourage you, it does not encourage you in one form or the other, then that word did not come for encouragement. The word coming for encouragement should either minister to you through edification to build you up, through exhortation to lift you up out of your current circumstance or situation, or comfort to ensure that it keeps you up and out of the valley of despondency. There's an important order that I'd like to share with us, which we can consider while we wait for the fulfillment of prophecy. Because I understand that we are in a season where many of us are waiting for the fulfillment of personal prophecies, corporate prophecies, national prophecies, global prophecies. So there's an important order that I'd like to share with us for us to consider so that we are encouraged while waiting. And that order is simple. Prophecy, praise, power, performance. Four Ps. Prophecy, praise, power, and then performance. And so when the prophecy comes, 
what we're supposed to do while waiting is to praise. And from that praise, we now receive what? Strength. We now receive that staying power to be able to wait on the Lord even further. Because the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And when that staying power has now come, we are now able to wait until the performance of the word of the Lord. So prophecy, you receive the prophecy, and then what happens? The response should be what? Praise. The response shouldn't be asking questions of when would it happen or how would it happen, but to give him thanks and to praise him because of the words that have come forth. And then from that praise now comes the staying power. And that staying power now helps us in the moment of waiting until we see the performance of his promises and of his word to us. And lastly, how to receive encouragement. Return. Return. I know the word return does not seem to make sense, but this is another dimension or medium through which we can receive encouragement. Now, because discouragement is a sin, we have seen that discouragement is a sin, and we also know, we've been on the sin series, that sin will take us away from fellowship with the Lord. In returning to the Lord, what now happens is that we receive rest. We receive what? Rest. And that rest now brings about salvation because the Bible says in Isaiah 30 verse 15, that in returning and rest shall you be saved. And the Bible now says concerning the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15 from verse 17 to 24, that what happened, he had gone, he had left. He, he had taken the resources, he had taken his inheritance and he went and he squandered it. But when he returned, what happened? The father received him. And what did the father say? Looking at verse 22, he says, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and stand us on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. And so there is also joy in heaven when a Christian, a believer who has been depressed, who has been discouraged, is now restored. And so the Lord is saying, return. The Lord is calling us to return. I'd like us to just begin to pray. Have you been discouraged? Have you been in a state where you've been downcast, you've been downtrodden? Just begin to return. Just begin to return. Just begin to tell the Lord that I return. Begin to return. Re come to that place of repentance, having understood that discouragement is a sin. Come to that place of repentance where we repent of it and begin to receive grace. Draw grace from the presence of the Lord even as we return. Shango bele devrena skoshkem brana taka ze devrede keiba. We return to you, O God. We come back to you, Father, and we ask for mercy. However, we've been discouraged. However, we stayed in the valley of despondency for so long. We come before your presence, Lord Jesus, and we repent of our sins. We ask, Father, for mercy. We receive mercy from you, and we return. We return to you, O God. We return to you. We return to your presence. We return to fellowship with you. We return to that place of union with you. For we know that it is your desire for us to be encouraged. We know that discouragement will keep us apart from you. Discouragement will cause our sights to go dim and cause us not to see that which you are doing. Discouragement will short circuit that which you are doing and cause us not to participate and be receptive, be receptive to that which you are doing, Father. We thank you for your word that has come forth and we begin to return. We begin to return. Mashanga Devranataskoshkedanka Balevia. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. While we're praying just now, I, I, I heard in my spirit the will of change. And the Lord, the Lord said, in returning, the will of change will be activated. In returning, the will of change will be activated. And what this word means is that in returning, what will begin to happen is that 
there will be a change of circumstances. There will be a change of circumstances. What, what was not provided before will not become provided. What was not available before will not become available. The circumstance itself will change. And then you as an individual will also change. He's saying that returning will activate the will of change on our behalf. And so Father, we thank you. And we return to you. We return to you. We return to you. And even as we return, thank you, Father, because the will of change is activated. The will of change is activated. And the words that have tarried, the words that have lingered, they now switch into a, a place, oh God, of performance. We leave that place of waiting and we enter that phase of performance because this is what the wheel of change that you have sent to us will do and for that we say thank you thank you jesus thank you father thank you glorious god and the lord is saying to us be encouraged be encouraged i I have not left you. I have not forsaken you. Be encouraged. I have not left you. I have not forsaken you. Return to me. Return, return. Return to me and you will see my salvation. Return to me and you will experience true rest. And you will experience true rest. And you shall begin to experience the rest that comes from me. Return and you shall see my salvation. Return and you shall see my glory. Return and you shall see my power. Return and shall see my power. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I, I just saw something happen in the spirit. And what I saw happen was that I saw an individual, which I know is representative of a number of others. This individual returned. When this individual returned to the Lord, what now took place in the spirit was that the the vessels that were all open before. Now, the, the vessels in the vision, they all spoke of expectations, expectations and uh, prayers that were yet to be answered, prophecies that were yet to be fulfilled, petitions that were yet to receive answers from the Lord. And when the person now finally returned and the eyes were opened, what the person now saw was that every single vessel was overturned. In other words, every single thing that the person was waiting for had been fulfilled. Every single prophecy that was lingering was now fulfilled. Every single prayer that was waiting to receive answers was now answered. And then the waiting was now over. And then a new phase now began. And the Lord has shown us this to let us know what is happening even as we begin to return. Cycles will come to a close. Cycles will come to a close even as we leave that place of discouragement and ascend, even as the Lord has called us to ascend cycles that have gone on for far too long they will come to an end and because the wheel of change has been activated we as a people as individuals we are now entering into new seasons of glory new seasons of power and new seasons of honor says the lord new seasons of glory new seasons of power and new seasons of honor the lord says and this will begin to happen as a result of returning Thank you, Jesus. I, I also see a list of requests. I also see a list of, of requests. Um, and I see them being, being striked off, being striked off. And the Lord is saying, do not be discouraged. Be not discouraged. You have, you have waited long. You have waited long for, for these things to come to pass. I am bringing you into that season of fulfillment. I am bringing you into that season where you will see the actualization and the fulfillment of that which I have promised you. I, I do not lie. I do not change. I have promised you and I will keep my promise. I only ask you to return to me and stay in that place of fellowship with me and be not discouraged and you shall see my salvation and you shall see the answers coming to all the prayers that you have prayed before now. I also see dried, dried wells. I also see dried wells receiving fresh water from the Lord. I also see dried wells receiving fresh water from the Lord. And what the Lord is now doing is that he is now giving us a restoration and bringing about a time of refreshing. And so that's water that I saw in the vision is symbolic of two things. It's symbolic of restoration 
It's also symbolic of refreshing. And what is now happening is that the Lord has now given us restoration. He has now given us a time of refreshing in his presence. Have you been dry before now? Have you been going through a wilderness experience? Have you been going through a dry season? The Lord is saying that I have now caused your wilderness to become a fruitful field. And I would also cause your fruitful field to become a forest this is my salvation to you. This is my deliverance to you. This is my promise to you. I have said it and I will do it. I have said it and I will do it. I, I, see, I see a person who has been, you've been trusting God for a job and I see not one job, but I see multiple jobs fall before you. I see multiple job opportunities come before you and you now had, you now came into that state where you are now in a dilemma of trying to choose um, which job is it? Where does God want me to go? Do I take this job or that job? You that did not have a job before or have any opportunity, you've now come into that phase where multiple job opportunities are now begin to come. And I believe that this is a word for someone under the sound of my voice because you have waited, you have waited for, for this job. You have been waiting, you have been waiting. And the Lord is now saying that your waiting has come to an end and I have now given you this job. I, I, I see someone in the spirit. I see someone in the spirit right now. You are, you, are, you are pondering. You are wondering about a hidden concern of your heart. Something you don't share. You don't share it easily. You don't share it easily. You've, you've kept it, you know, you've kept it close to your chest, close to your heart. You've kept it close to yourself and you have not really been sharing that with people. And it has been a concern for you. I hear the Lord say, resolve. I hear the Lord say, resolve. I heard the Lord say, resolve. And so the Lord is resolving those hidden concerns of the heart. Those hidden concerns of the heart. The Lord is causing them to be resolved. And he says, be encouraged. Be encouraged. I, I also see I also see drums. I also see drums. I, I see the beating of drums in the spirit. I see the beating of drums in the spirit. And the, this beating of drums is an announcement of a new season. This beating of drums is an announcement of a new season. Shaiko Pelene Sakaiki Kaskum Breveto Taika. Even as September comes to an end and you enter into October, says the Lord, you enter into a new season of my glory, a new season of my power, a new season of my honor. Those that have honored me in times past, you will now begin to see my honor. And I will cause many others to bring honor to you. As many that have given me the glory before now, you shall begin to experience my glory. And as many that have chosen to walk, not by their own power or might or strength, you shall begin to see my power. My power, says the Lord. And the Lord has ushered in a new season of glory, of power, and of honor. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Now, I see that the Lord will cause something to happen among us. He will cause something to happen among us that will cause some people to begin to say, this thing looks like, you know, it looks as if it happened by chance. It is, it is so good to be true. How can God just do something like this? And the, 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 the vision that I saw was the vision of a, of a lottery, of a lottery. It came like a, a lottery. You know, it was, it, it was so good to be true. And the Lord is saying that you shall begin to see such occurrences among you. I will cause things to happen that many will, will think are too good to be true. I will begin to cause those things to begin to happen within your midst, says the Lord. And I am telling you beforehand, so that you will know that when it happens, it did not happen by chance, says the Lord. Let's just give God thanks. Let's give him praise. Let's give him glory. Let's give him honor. Let's thank him for his word.